The world faces many challenges, not least on the medical front. Among those challenges remains cancer. Some statistics say that one in every three people will eventually develop the disease. The word cancer, though, is often used in a misleading way, as there is no such thing as the cancer. Rather, there exist more than 100 different kinds of cancer. But regardless of whether the skin, blood, brain or internal organs are affected, these different types do have one thing in common, and that's the abnormal growth of cells. Cancer cells develop in an uncontrolled way and often spread to other organs, a process that in many cases leads to death. In Germany, for instance, the majority of male cancer patients die of lung cancer, while breast cancer is the main offender among female patients. What are the, the causes, the uniqueness? What are the difference between the cancer cell and the normal cell? And this question, of course, has been asked for many years, and people have found lots and lots of differences, but these differences are too many, if any, and they really they don't make much sense. Some of them can be explained by saying that uh, a cancer cell is in a persistent state of growth, and therefore, because it never shuts off, never reaches that other stage that uh, qui quiescence, uh, which normal cells always have. But actually, cell division is a normal process and a necessary one. If there were no cell division, the human body, a highly complex system of organs, could not develop, grow or regenerate, nor could genetic information be handed down across the different generations. There are two kinds of cell division. On the one hand, meiosis is vital for sexual reproduction and produces gametes with half of the usual set of chromosomes. Mitosis in humans, on the other hand, produces cells with what's known as a diploid set of 46 chromosomes. But cells also need to die, sometimes through a kind of programmed cell suicide known as apoptosis. This process is necessary for the regulation of the cell count and the elimination of sick cells. The division, growth and death of cells are tightly regulated by a molecular system of signals, barriers and repair systems. But even though all these internal safeguards exist and usually work well within the human body, sometimes a genetic mistake, a so-called mutation, can occur. Subsequently, a cell might alter its usual behavior and start growing in an uncontrolled way, thereby producing a tumor. The genes whose mutations can cause cancer are called oncogenes. Today we know that mutations of genetic information can be triggered by high doses of ultraviolet radiation or by certain mutagenic chemicals. But cancer can also be caused by smoking or an unbalanced and unhealthy diet. An individual's age also plays a role when it comes to the development of cancer. That's because the older we get, the more likely it is that a mistake can happen during cell division. And on top of all that, viral infections too are strongly linked to the development of the disease. The study of cancer by viruses called highly oncogenic retroviruses has been avidly pursued for a great number of years because of the very simple ability of these viruses to cause cancer. In contradistinction to the usual multi-stage nature of carcinogenesis, these viruses can infect a normal cell and in a single step change the normal cell into a cancer cell. Scientific research on cancer has been around for some time. In 1927, Johannes Fiebiger was the first researcher to be awarded a Nobel Prize for his work on the disease. Ironically, thanks to a scientific error, Fiebiger had fed rats with cockroaches that carried a worm called Spiroptera carcinoma. The rats eventually developed stomach cancer and died as a consequence. But when Fiebiger could still find the worm in the dead rats, he drew the false conclusion that it must have been the parasite that caused the cancer. It was only later that the real reason for the rat's tumor could be identified, a bad diet. But Fiebiger was not the only one interested in the field of cancer research. By 1910, Peyton Roos had identified the very first tumor virus. He managed to extract a virus from an infected hen and injected it into healthy chicks. 
They then developed cancer as a result. But research in the field was just beginning. And even though Roos's work sparked debate among scientists, it would take over 50 years for him to be awarded a Nobel Prize for his cancer research. Scientists did not let up on the virus front, and rightly so. These tiny packets of genetic information are crucial to our understanding of cancer. At the moment, it's estimated that one in seven to one in five tumors is caused by chronic viral infections. Viruses are not able to survive on their own and need host cells in order to reproduce. To achieve this, the virus must take over the host cell, injecting its own genetic information into the host. This then dies or starts to run amok on a cellular level. Two different types of viruses are currently known to us. There are those whose genetic information is saved in double helix DNA and those that carry single helix RNA. RNA needs a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase to transform RNA into DNA before viral genes can be reproduced. It was David Baltimore, Renato Dulbeco and Howard Temin who ultimately uncovered how this mechanism works. One widely known tumor virus is HPV, or the human papilloma virus. It causes cervical cancer in women. It was Harald Zorhausen whose scientific studies demonstrated this. Now there exists a wide array of HPV subtypes that we can identify, and at least 15 of them are linked to tumor growth. Fortunately though, science has made great strides when it comes to cervical cancer treatment. So today, HPV vaccines are effective against two to four of the high-risk strains of these viruses. All the same, women over 30 should still have regular checkups. Despite the intensive research on cancer over the past 100 years, the majority of different cancer types remain incurable. There is simply no one therapy or any one medication that's effective against the disease. But we are still deeply into cancer. Cancer cells are very sophisticated. They have all kinds of tricks to live under hypoxic conditions, to develop other blood vessels, and so on and so forth. So it's not that simple. So you see again, people did launch major attacks on major diseases, but apparently nature tricks us. Therapeutic outcomes for patients have improved markedly though. This is due to advances in surgery, radiation therapy, and new forms of medicinal treatment that complement established chemotherapies. On top of this, healthcare providers have dedicated more resources to cancer prevention. The decoding of the human genome opens the way for a more customized treatment, one oriented towards the genetic makeup of the individual patient and their particular disease. There's increasing hope that cancer may go from being a terminal illness to being a chronic condition.